today we're going to uh, look at testing some basic components. So uh, I've called this LCR testing, and the reason is that L is for inductor, C for capacitor, R for resistor. Now, at the back are a couple of vintage testers. On the right is the Telomic uh, TO5 capacitor analyzer, but it can also measure uh, turns ratio of, of uh, various things, including uh, inductors. On the left is a uh, solar capacitor analyzer. There also were bridges that were used back in the day, and both of these are basically bridges. And I've previously shown at least one of those, the ICO uh, CLR, or LRC, whatever you want to call it, uh, bridge that can measure uh, resistance and capacitance, and if you have an inductor standard, it can measure an inductor. But those are the vintage equipment, and particularly with regard to capacitors, they tended to be used to measure capacitance and leakage current. Below them are some more modern testers, including a couple here from Peak Atlas, one that is designed to measure equivalent series resistance of a capacitor, the other that is an LCR meter itself, then the DE5000 LCR meter, very good instrument. The, uh, I think it's called AA88, anyway, it's the Electronic Specialties uh, in-circuit ESR tester. And then on the far right there at the bottom is a uh, uh, T4 LCR and other components tester. So, one of the things that I would like to do is spend this video talking about why we have to do different tests depending on the type of component, for example, electrolytic versus paper or film, mica, why we might need to do different measurements depending on the circuit, like tube circuits versus solid state circuits, and what is the equipment that is appropriate for doing those various tests. Now, for example, this LCR meter is very versatile. It will do a wide variety of inductance, capacitance, and resistance measurements. It will measure ESR and Q and dissipation and all of those things that we will talk about as a little, little bit further along. But one thing it will not do is test a capacitor under high voltage. This tester and this tester will do that, but they will not give you ESR or dissipation, although they will give you power factor, which has uh, is related to dissipation. So, for those that are interested in proceeding immediately to the testing of these components and the hardware and uh, that kind of thing, I suggest that you simply skip ahead and, and skip the rest of this if you also have a good grounding in basic components and the theory behind them and what goes wrong with them and so on. You might also want to skip the rest of this video because from, for the rest of this video I'm going to be talking about the characteristics of capacitors, inductors, and resistors that require that we be able to test them under a variety of different conditions for a variety of different uh, measurements. So, let's proceed with that, and uh, I hope that for those of you that either haven't seen the theory for a while or, or never have seen it, that you'll stay tuned for what proves to be, I hope, a, a fairly clear explanation of what a lot of these terms like uh, ESR and dissipation and so on mean. 
Let me begin this part by admitting something that uh, some of you that know me or have worked with me in the past or just watched some of my videos know is I was very much influenced in my uh, focus on uh, measurement by the folks who teach metrology, that is the science of measurement, for the National Institutes of uh, for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And one of the things that they always emphasized is you don't measure resistance or impedance, you compute it. And what they were getting to is that things like voltage and current are defined in terms of fundamental quantities and you actually that's what you're measuring. And then you compute resistance by dividing the voltage by the, the, uh, the current. That's important in when you go and, and that for a DC circuit uh, that gives you the DC resistance. For a an AC circuit, the uh, you get instead of a resistance, you get an impedance, which is the combination of a resistance and a reactance, and that's a function of frequency. But once again, it's still just the voltage divided by the current, and it's often written as R plus or minus J X. All they mean here is there's a resistive component. And then 90 degrees to that, there is a reactive component. Uh, mathematicians use I here, uh, but of course we can't use I because as, elect as uh, electronics uh, engineers, because we already use I for current. So instead of plus or minus I X, we changed it to J. And the X is defined in terms of frequency. For an inductor, it's 2 pi FL, that is 2 pi times the frequency times the inductance. And for a capacitor, it's 1 over 2 pi FC. Once again, the 2 pi F uh, is often called omega, the combination, and then C is the capacitance. So those are our fundamentals. Everything else I'm going to talk about is available on this page. So this is a one-page uh, lecture. Yeah, it's a little busy. So here are vector diagrams. Remember I said plus and minus J? Well, all that means is along this axis and the, the R part is along this axis, that is the uh, horizontal. And in a circuit with resistance only, the current and the voltage are in phase with each other. Now, uh, I've, I know that some of you may be used to seeing this on an oscilloscope with uh, phase relationships and so on. I find that most people who really want to understand this prefer these vector diagrams because it's easier to keep this in your head. Remembering, well, was that sine wave uh, on the left of that uh, is is less, uh, let's just say, is tends to not be remembered as well as these diagrams. So if you remember that we begin with the basic idea that in a resistor, the current and the voltage are in phase with each other, and you divide the voltage by the uh, current, you get the resistance. But in an AC circuit, so we normally draw the inductive reactance as plus J and the capacitive reactance as minus J. And what that does is it uh, causes the current to be in the plus R direction, that is to the right. If you have a circuit that has both an inductor and a capacitor, the two will offset one another. And depending on the frequency, the total reactance of that combination will, will vary depending on how much inductive reactance there is and how much capacitive reactance there is. And that's what's shown by this vector. So if, for example, you have a, a small amount of inductive reactance and a larger amount of capacitive reactants, the net total will be a capacitive reactance, but of less magnitude. 
by a magnitude that's equal to the difference between these two. Now, at a low frequency, and here we're showing just a capacitor, at a low frequency, the capacitor will have a certain amount of reactance, and the, there is a certain amount of resistance in the circuit. There's always resistance present, and quite frankly, there's always inductance and uh, capacitance present as well, but they may be minuscule. So, we wind up with a, an impedance, an overall impedance, which is the vector sum of the resistance and the reactance. And it's drawn like this. If you draw a line parallel to the x-axis from the, uh, the capacitive reactance in this case, and a line parallel to the j-axis, which uh, is, is, uh, represents the resistance, the vector from the center to that point is the impedance, and we call that Z. Z has both a magnitude, in other words, this the length of this vector, and a phase, which we also, which we use, usually call by this angle, the phase angle. Now, at a low frequency, capacitors tend to dominate, because of course they do not pass DC. And it's only when the frequency gets high enough that the capacitor begins to pass enough current to be uh, anything other than an open circuit. Similarly, in a high frequency circuit, it's the inductance that tends to dominate. Once again, if, the, uh, if you have a circuit with an inductor and a capacitor in it, the inductor becomes a bigger and bigger factor. The capacitor tends to become a, a, a smaller and smaller factor, or at least a smaller and smaller impedance. And at high frequencies, you get just the opposite diagram. In other words, instead of being down in the lower right quadrant, you have the uh, impedance in the upper uh, right quadrant. Once again, the, the resistance is along the x-axis and the, the impedance uh, of the, uh, or of the reactance of the inductive device is along the uh, y-axis or the j-axis. Okay, now you have enough background to start looking at what is it we want to test and how do we want to test it. There are two things that you want to test for when you test the, the overall, uh, an overall component. One is the effect of the resistance, and the other is the effect of the reactance. In a low impedance circuit, like a transistor circuit, the series resistance is the more important factor. The reason is that the series resistance, and in a capacitor that's the ESR, in an inductor that is just its DC resistance, tends to dissipate power. And the reason that, for example, in a switching mode power supply, the ESR is the most important factor is because it dissipates heat, and as the capacitor heats up, the ESR actually goes up because it's boiling away the electrolyte until eventually the ESR consumes so much power that the power supply fails. And that is where you see those bulging capacitors in power supplies. However, in a high impedance circuit, the reverse is generally true. In a high impedance circuit, it's usually the, uh, the parallel resistance called leakage that is a factor. So, for example, in a tube amplifier, this might be a coupling capacitor, and this is the leakage of the coupling capacitor. You'd like that coupling capacitor to completely block DC. But if it has high leakage, or a low parallel resistance, 
some of the DC from one side of the circuit will get to the other side. And when we get to testing capacitors for tube circuits uh, in a future video, we'll talk a lot more about this. So how do we decide whether it's uh, low or high impedance and so on? Well, we basically use these four or five rules. Obviously, if X is equal to R, it's in the middle. But if X, that is the reactive component, is way bigger than the resistive component, it's in one, at one end. And similarly, if the reactance is very, very small compared to the resistance, it's at the other end. So at, remember that, that X varies with frequency, but R does not. So let's now look at what we call dissipation or Q uh, or uh, basically the power lost. Remember we talked about the fact that the power that is lost is in the resistive element. So in this case, it's this R that absorbs power. A pure reactance does not absorb power. The power you put in is returned when you uh, on the next half cycle. So you charge up an, a capacitor and then you discharge it, and if it had no series uh, equivalent series resistance, you would get back exactly the same amount of power as you put in. And that leads us to, to this set of equations. In a capacitor, we measure the power lost, that is the ratio of the power lost to the power uh, returned, we call dissipation factor. And if you think about it a minute, a capacitor that's absorbing a lot of power has a high dissipation factor. A capacitor that is ideal, the, the dissipation is zero because there's no power lost. In an inductor, we tend to call that Q. And dissipation is just one over Q. In all cases, the ratio of the power lost to the power returned is also the ratio of the resistance to the reactants. And modern meters tend to measure these quantities. Some of the old vintage equipment I showed you does not, though there was a concept that still is used today in the power industry called power factor that is related to all of this. Basically, it is a way of determining how much power is lost in, in a circuit. So, let's now go to just the model of a capacitor. And obviously, there's a similar model for an inductor. This is the equivalent series resistance. Sometimes it's called RS. This is the capacity. It's the how much charge, how many electrons does the capacitor hold if a certain current has been put into it for a certain period of time. And this is the parallel resistance, also called leakage. Now, we said that in solid state circuits, the ESR tends to be the big problem because they are low impedance. In tube amplifiers, the leakage becomes important because it is a high impedance uh, circuit. Here are the things we might want to measure. In a capacitor, we might want to measure the capacitance, the ESR, the leakage, a factor I haven't talked about, its self-resonant frequency, and the dissipation. And a modern meter will read most of these, but as we will see, neither the self-resonant frequency nor the leakage under high voltage are tested by modern ESR or LCR testers. So we'll, at so someday we will look at how you, how you check those. For example, in tube circuits, you really care about the leakage. In high frequency circuits, RF, as you get up in the, in the gigahertz range, self-resonance becomes really important. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why surface mount devices are so much better than leaded components. After you get up above about 500 to uh, megahertz, the self-resonance of leaded devices, that is a, a device with wires sticking out both sides, becomes a significant design challenge.
And so that is the reason why that surface mount devices are so advantageous at high frequencies. Not only are they easy to pick in place and be assembled by robots, but they also have a low self-resonant, or a very, very high self-resonant frequency, often much higher than your circuit. With an inductor, we want to measure inductance, we want to measure the total resistance, we want to measure its Q, or quality, once again, how much power is lost versus how much power is returned. In an inductor, the power is stored in the magnetic field. As you begin to lower the current in an inductor, that magnetic field collapses and begins to return power to the circuit. In a perfect inductor, everything you put in comes right back out, and it does not dissipate any power. But a real inductor does. Q is a measure of the quality, how much power gets lost in the inductor. And once again, self-resonant frequency can be important. So those are the things that we're going to concentrate on. I'm going to close this video for now, intended to sort of lay the groundwork. In, the, in some future videos, we're going to talk about testing capacitors. We're going to talk about testing capacitors in, for use in solid state circuits, as well as in tube circuits. We're also going to talk about testing inductors. And obviously, resistors become important because they are a part of these measurements. Obviously, if you can't measure resistance, then you can't measure ESR or leakage. So that's where we're going. I hope this has laid the groundwork for future discussion so that when I talk about things like dissipation in a capacitor, uh, you'll understand where it fits. Once again, appreciate you watching. Hope that you got something out of this. And I also hope you'll stay safe and have a nice day.